Our story starts at the end of the 19th century and in Berlin, city planners were tearing their hair out about the increased traffic the city faced, looking to find a solution to the problem. To help with this issue, along came a man called Werner von Siemens, yes, the man to which the company is named after, who proposed the construction of an elevated railway, similar to what was being built in New York at the time. There was an alternative solution proposed for an underground railway, but these were rejected due to city fears of an underground railway impacting on the city sewer system, so an elevated railway was the chosen option. Work on the railway began by Siemens in 1896 and was completed in 1902, with the first section running from Potsdamer Platz to Strahlauer Tor. The line would then be quickly extended to Warschauer Straße in the east of the city, to Zulische Garten in the west, and makes up today's U1 and U2 lines. Initial proposals by Siemens wanted the route of the line to pass by the Friedrichstraße. However, these were amended as it was a rather wealthy part of the city and the residents nearby didn't want a big noisy railway passing through their back garden, so the railway would pass through the poorer areas. As the line moved eastwards, the issues of sewers would diminish, allowing the line to get its first underground section between the Zulische Garten and Kni, now Ernst Reuter Platz, in 1902, built using cut and cover and today makes up a section of the U2 line. The initial system was a success and by the 1920s the network had grown to four routes which would be called the Klein Profil or Small Profile Network due to the trains being designed as the dimensions of trams being used at the time. The eagled eye of you might see that the system mostly operated from east to west of the city. The reasons for this was that these were the most wealthy areas of the city so would bring in the most amount of profit for the companies who operated the lines. However, there was a growing movement to provide the city with lines which would run north to south to serve the poor areas which included Wedding and Neukölln. Time for a quick lesson on the geography of Berlin. Before the 1920s, Berlin we have today was made up of different towns and villages which all had their own agendas, meaning that things could get a bit heated when it came to building railways through their territory. However, this would all change in 1920 when the surrounding areas to Berlin were annexed to form a gross Berlin, so all the bickering between the areas beforehand would be no more, allowing the network to expand easier. The first north to south line, which makes up a section of today's U6, was opened in 1923. This would be the first line to adopt the gross profil or large profil design, allowing for wider carriages than what were designed for on the Klein profil lines. This would allow for greater capacity on these lines without the need for extending platforms which was a rather costly exercise, especially for a cash-strapped post-World War I Germany. If you know your German history, then you'll know that the early 1920s weren't the best time for the country, and this was reflected in its design of the U-Bahn. With all that hyperinflation looking about at the time, there was only enough money to provide basic stations. There would be no fancy artwork, and the steel columns would be exposed for the world to see and tot at. Also, as there was no money for new trains to run on the gross profil system, trains from the older Klein profil network were modified to run on the new lines, but as these trains were narrower, they weren't wide enough to reach the platforms, so wooden boards would have to be put in between the train and the edge of the platform every time passengers would board the train. As you can probably tell, times were hard, but the network would continue to plough on and expand. By the time the man with the moustache came to power, the U-Bahn had grown to 76 kilometres in length, carrying over 250 million passengers annually. However, as resources started to pour in for Hitler's military, none of that love was spared on the U-Bahn, which received no further extensions during the Third Reich. But one thing it did receive was a lot of bombs, suffering over 400 points of damage on the network, leaving the system in ruins by the end of the war which would take until 1950 for the network 
to be fully repaired. After the war, Berlin was a divided city, with the Western Allies controlling the western areas of the city and the Soviets the eastern parts. This division increasingly took hold on the U-Bahn, which included the separation of the city's transport provider, BVG, into an east and west company. Despite all these issues, the network would continue to expand and the citizens could move freely between the eastern and western sections of the network. However, all the tension between the east and west would eventually boil over with the construction of the Berlin Wall dividing the city once and for all. The construction of the wall would have a huge impact on the U-Bahn for coming decades, as there were sections of primarily West Berlin lines such as the U6 and U8 which passed through East Berlin. Stations located in the East Berlin part would be completely shut and these would be known as ghost stations. During times of the Berlin Wall, as West Berlin was being propped up by capitalist West Germany, there was plenty of dollar to expand the network, and they even had money for a magnetically levitating train system called the M-Bahn, which could have a video of its own. Drop a like if you'd like to see that happen. In contrast, you might have guessed the extension in the east weren't as frequent, with the main one being the extension of the U5 to Hörnor, which was just finished before the wall came down. As the wall came down in 1989, so did the division within the U-Bahn, and all restrictions were removed by the 1st July 1990, and the ghost stations would open back up, being restored to their former glory. With the network back to being one system, the U-Bahn has continued to expand throughout the post-war decades to 173 stations with 94 miles of route length and shows the resilience of the network, whatever the situation may be. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, you might like to watch the story behind Berlin's other famous landmark, the Berliner Fernsehentron, which is linked on screen. Make sure you drop a like and subscribe and join us as we continue to tell the stories behind the world's greatest achievements, one wonder at a time. This has been a civil conversation and I will see you in the next video.